Welcome back to the Ink Sync. I am Annie. I'm Kaylee. This is the publishing podcast for the rest of us, where we are talking about all of your favorite books and all of your favorite movies that somehow no one's ever seen. <laughs> is it weird? Did you ever? Do you ever found that like you? Yes. No one has ever. Annie, seen literally like, every person Annie's. I've ever told about my favorite movie has been like, "What's that?" <laughs> Lady Hawk is a really good movie, you guys. Tell me about Lady Hawk. What's Lady Hawk? You know I like that. Yeah, I, I, I'll tell everyone. Is that I'll the tell... one with Sean Connery? No, no. It's the one with Matthew Broderick. Matthew Broderick. So I'll, I've told Annie about this. Who She's... are clearly very different people. <laughs> She's very kindly giving me another platform to talk about this movie. <laughs> but I've told her about it like 17 times. It is one of my favorite movies. Our current discussion topic today is actually book to screen adaptations. This feels like that, oh. but it's not. It is a fairy tale, but it's a fairy tale that's only loosely based off of existing media content. In this case, it would have been an old French story. It takes elements from several stories, but it isn't, it's been combined in such a way that is unique to itself, in uh-huh. my opinion, in that tradition. So Lady Hawk is a very, very much classic fairy tale idea. You've got your lucky rogue who starts down on their luck, but then manages to turn their fate around, their fortunes around. And then you've got the cursed lovers, you've got the the vile religious figure, in this case, the bishop, who made dark deals with the devil. So it's very much a classic fairy tale, but that was written in like the 70s or 80s. And so it's got um, Michelle Pfeiffer, Matthew Broderick, uh, oh. Rucker Hauer. Like, it really starts out a cast, yeah. to be honest. It's just such a fun movie, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. Um, you've got a kindly drunken monk. Oh, who, who made it a mistake? Why is that a thing in it's so fairy tales? Consistent. It's like, so why consistent. is it the drunk? Mo- I guess. I mean, I guess monks. They were making the wine. They were the ones that stuff. had yeah. access to all that stuff. Like we, were <laughs> we just about talked earlier. about this last yeah, episode. Last episode. <laughs> well, that's what I'm saying. It's like they had access to the to the materials, the education. Right. The but, happy monks were drunk. So our our topic today, I guess I should say, is um is is book to screen adaptations. Mm-hmm. Um, Annie, what do you? What do you want to talk about today? Oh, I'm so excited. So Stardust, written by Neil Gaiman. So good. I love this story. Um, Speaking of fairy tales, like, this is completely related. You know I Um, love fairy tales. Like, you just tailored this episode for me. I should should have, but I didn't. Um, I'm not that good of a friend, sadly. I just also (laughs) like this movie a lot. Okay, Kaylee. So we're talking about Stardust today. This is a much requested episode. Um, Not Stardust, but book to movie adaptations. A lot of people, when they hear that we have a podcast, I don't know if you get this, they say to me, oh, you should do book to movie adaptations when they hear we have a book podcast. I have heard that, but mainly on like where you publish things. (laughs) This is like a big thing because a lot of people love movies. A lot of people love books, but I would say probably more people love movies, and that's fine. And there are very, 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 very many podcasts about movies. And I think that that's probably why people are like, well, you clearly need to talk about movies. I'm probably going to cut that out because that sounds mildly insulting. It's not. I just mean that there are a lot of podcasts about about movies. It's true. And it's fine. But one of the main reasons that we haven't done one up till now is, and I mean this very seriously, this is a huge topic. The and book people get to very mo- passionate about it. The book to movie adaptation game is an entire industry. It is genuinely an industry. It's a high stakes industry. There's a lot going on. It's very close knit. There's a lot of drama. But it is genuinely a whole industry. So it was something where every single book and every single movie have their own stories and then connecting those two also every single different project has its own story so i was like there's no way for us to just do that in one episode so it occurred to me a little while ago that because every single book to movie adaptation has its own story let's just do single book to movie adaptations and talk about it that way so kaylee we are starting with stardust stardust we made a big list of like books and that their adaptations. Like, like our favorites. Yes. It was genuinely our favorites. It was, very large and there was like list, a 20 though. or 30 like like item list. And we were like, at first we went super blank. And then we we're like, oh, wait, no, no, this is fine. Yeah. And then we were able to like figure it out. But like, yeah. we definitely both zeroed in on Stardust. We did. Yeah. We were both like, I would love to do Stardust. And Which, Stardust is its own unique thing because it actually has two books. Yep. So doing Stardust first is was the only thing we we really could probably do but also it may be in my opinion a disservice to literally everything else because it was so well done 
it's such a good it's so movie well done. and such a good book and so for those of you who don't know kaylee why don't you give us a quick intro to these books sure so stardust was originally conceived by neil gaiman as a an illustrated novella it's 200 ish pages i think 150 200 pages um and some of those are fully just illustrated mm-hmm. pages yep. i would say the text probably takes up like 150 tops yeah and it is a fairy tale just a straight up fairy tale is an early book in neil gaiman's career i guess entity novella in his career that he basically wrote as the novella and then immediately adapted as a novel full-on mm-hmm. novel that was then picked up to be transformed into a movie so the the concepts at the time like he definitely like leaned in so hard to the fairy tale like concepts and world building so it's a love story like most fairy tales or many fairy tales are but it's also about magic Mm -hmm. in the world the magic of love and how love saves you especially in the book love saves you without even doing anything (laughs) yeah in the book specifically yeah um in the in the movies i would say it's still that argument but it's a little more active but yeah, so so they're they're very good, I would say. They're and they're very different. The books themselves are similar in my opinion. Yes. There are some differences again because the novel is a lot more fleshed out. It's a novel. It's a exactly. full-length novel. It's a, a full-on novel. But like I I'd say that the themes are definitely there, but it's just for the novella but it's more it's more akin to like if you've got a fleshed out version of a Grimm's fairy tale which Grimm's fairy tales tend to be just a couple pages Mm, good point that's a good that's a good way to make that parallel yeah so Annie why don't you tell us about the uh the movie so the movie uh was actually a cult classic so it came out in theaters it did okay in theaters and then unfortunately it didn't do better we could have gotten a sequel we could (sighs) and it became after that an aftermarket cult classic it's one of those ones where it's just so freaking good that everybody and their mother loved it anyone who sees this movie loves it i've never seen someone who's like oh i don't like stardust no one says that everyone's like i love stardust it's just a matter of have you seen it yeah starring uh robert de niro michelle pfeiffer charlie cox and this is one of his baby first... charlie cox yeah absolutely, yes, baby charlie cox claire danes only like 25 at this point um, but she was post uh, whatever that sitcom was she was in when she was a teenager. So, she, like, it felt like she was older, but she really wasn't. She was only, like, 25. Pre-Homeland, though. It also has, like, pre-Tudors, I think. Henry Cavill. Oh, yeah, yeah. 100%. And uh, Sienna Miller, like, mid-tabloid cast. Sienna Miller. The cast um, is a phenomenal cast. It's so Let's good. Be clear. Mark Strong, before he hit mm-hmm. his, like, Mark Strong villain era. So it's it's just an incredible cast. It really, really is. Like, and, and there's yeah. a very good script, but also. Mm-hmm. Oh, Ricky Gervais. Yep. Oh, yeah, that's right. Mm-hmm. We should watch it. <laughs> Again. we should have watched it instead of playing video games earlier <sighs> that's what we should have done anyway so i mean the movie's really 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 good uh, it follows the main plot I, i'd say that the the plot is the same but like the way that they get there like a and B, a and z the uh, the start and end points are are, are the same but like mm-hmm. how we get there is very yeah. different in the book versus the movie because of the nature of this the, the medium in my opinion and i think they both do it very well so we're going to run through this chronologically because that was just how we thought this might work best so we're going to actually talk about the illustrated novella first and then we'll talk about the novel and then we'll talk about the rights deals and then we'll talk about the movie so tell us about the plot of stardust so the plot of stardust is more along the lines like i said it's a fairy tale so you've got pseudo modern ish history during queen victoria's reign but in a world where magic operates alongside of our world. And that's a lot of, of modern fairy tales have, have started with that premise in some form or fashion, not necessarily during Queen Victoria's reign, but like in a version of history, pick the point, throw that concept down. In fairy tales, you've got a lot of your concepts around like love and commitment and like the prodigal son. And in this case, what actually happened in the book is that a normal or at least a non-magical person becomes emotionally enchanted like in that they i don't want to say like they fall in love with somebody that is a uh, fairy touched magic touched i think she was half human at least or in some fashion but she was beautiful and interesting and yeah. it's very different from anything that he had seen he was a farm boy basically yeah 
at this market that opens up once every nine years near his town. And his town is basically the border town between our world and the fairy realm, essentially. Right. And so he ended up spending one night with his love. Mm -hmm. who was essentially a, we'll say an indentured servant to a magical witch, to a witch who went around selling curiosities and enchantments and such. Mm -hmm. So he purchased a a curiosity, an enchantment, an artifact for a kiss and fell in love. Was like, if you, I think you're, you're, I vibe well, let's meet back here. So he showed up. (laughs) They had a wonderful night, and then he kind of got real fucked up over the fact that he was in love with this lady who was no longer around, but his family negotiated a marriage to his betrothed, and they kind of were like, okay, well, we just have to live in the world. Mm -hmm. Nine months later, there was his son from this fairy lady. So there's your prodigal son. The idea of the fairy tale conceit in general is the journey has to happen and there's usually a reason behind it. So what, you know, what's the reason? And love is frequently the answer whether or not, you know, you've, you're approaching it from maybe the best angle. So in the novella, this kid falls in love with a rather snooty young lady and she asks for a star that has recently fallen to, in order to give him Perfect. Yeah, there's a there's a flash forward, and the the kid of our man who fell in love with a fairy lady grew up mm-hmm. into this teenager, and his like loves her his his coming of age story is yeah. the main plot. Yeah, yeah. In that you would... oh yeah, he's not a teenager. Sorry, yeah. I didn't mean to imply. That. Okay, cool. No, I, I just in case anybody hasn't seen yeah, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I just want to make sure that they know. So yeah, so he's going on a journey to find this star, and he finds the star and how that all kind of plays out um Mm -hmm. there's a co like a the 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 plot that's going along with this of course is in fairy there is a kingdom stormhold that is undergoing a transition of power and the king has four sons i think three or three or four sons left out of his uh seven sons that could potentially inherit the throne and you know he it's not just a straightforward it goes to the eldest sort of deal it's a murder each other until there's only one left inheritance of power Mm -hmm. so he essentially is just like well you've still got brothers left so i'm gonna make this as complicated as possible for you so i love a good dickish dad you know it's so good like (laughs) and the fact that it's just like this is just the way it is like it's not like he's abusive or anything it's just just like it would be really funny if all my sons died and you're like what Go ahead. You can see his dead, like his dead sons are like in the plot the whole time. Like they can't, yeah. like the, the sons that are dead, yeah, are there the right. whole time. It's, They're, yeah, it's so so interesting. Which is, I guess, it's been a while since I read the book. Are they? They do they feature in the book as well? Yeah, oh, that's funny. <laughs> so the dad has like his the artifact that designates their authority power, which is this uh, sapphire. No, topaz. In the, the, the magic ruby? Oh, in the book? Oh, I don't remember. No, I think it's not Sorry. a ruby in the book. In the movie, it's it a looked, ruby. It looked, it's very, well, that's because that rubies are very Nice and red. Visual. <laughs> yeah, I'm pretty I got sure you. it's like a topaz. I okay. want to say it's like a topaz, but okay. I'm pro- I could be wrong. I believe you. Anyway, does, the gemstone that designated the authority and right to rule. He basically threw it, and somehow with the magic of being a fairy king, he knocked a star out of the sky. <laughs> and that's the start he either that, had really good aim or really bad aim i don't think yeah i think he had really good aim okay and it was enhanced by like he made a vow basically and he wanted it to be complicated oh yeah had to be a quest so he knocked this poor star out of the sky and then in the other city where tristran and um victoria are like talking and he's trying to like convince her to marry him even though he doesn't have anything to offer Mm -hmm. and that's when she pulls the there's that fallen star go get it for me and i'll marry you kind Uh of deal you know that old chestnut of course yeah the old chestnut yeah the old the old rube (laughs) so he's like yeah sure and he essentially just goes off it's a little little harder in the uh in the movie for comedic and visual effects his dad just basically is like, yeah, it's time for him to go. And they're like, okay. And then the the movie is a little more complicated than that. <laughs> but yeah, so he's going off to find the star and like learn and like just experience fairy. The novella especially is 100% more interested in introducing cool concepts in the world and like doing like nods to like the fairy realm and, and stuff, which I think definitely mimic 
older, more spare storytelling styles for Grimm's fairy tales and like historic German and French folklore because they're not long they're not gonna be super lengthy they're just gonna be like oh you know the thing mm -hmm. i'm just gonna say the, th the three words that you need to kind of remind you about like the swamp of sorrow or whatever you know right Th that was just I, I pulled that out of the air but like stuff like that like it's not gonna it's just gonna be like and then this really tragic place moving on mm -hmm. like they're just gonna tell you a little bit so he goes through and he's just like him finding these things and him meeting the people and the different archetypes that show up in folklore the helpful stranger right gives him his the candle right the witches is the third plot in this even in this novella <laughs> i just want to be clear some movies some full novels can't manage one full plot right which in this novella that's 150 yeah. pages like you know, game always is. makes it complicated but he does it so well so you've got the kid on the love mission the right. quest for his love Right. Then you've got the uh, sons that are trying to find the stone so that they can inherit their kingdom. Right. And then you've got these witches that don't care are, about the ruby, but want the star. They want the star. Or sorry, not the ruby, the, the stone. Sorry. Well, no, no, they want the star. They want the stone. They her heart. They don't care about the, yeah, the Oh, gemstone. no, I mean, I said the ruby and I, oh, I yeah, meant the, the stone. Gemstone. Yeah, yeah, you're correct. Sorry. Like, I'm sorry. It's topaz. Anyway, so the the witches are three sisters. And again, that comes up as Macbeth, you know the mythology and they're trying to find the star for their own purposes specifically eternal youth again comes up a lot and they're not great so different people trying to trying to succeed in their at their endeavors for different reasons and then who ends up winning and what does it take kind of deal why don't you tell us the the main differences between the illustrated novella and the full-length novel and then you can hit on a couple other plot points well i think that it was kind of a transition so the the novel and the novella both were more focused on the world building and the characters were more archetypal but the novella was really on the far end of that spectrum whereas the novel started bringing in more characterization for them i mean they definitely had their own character points and uh -huh. their beats Especially Yvain, who is the star, in my yeah. opinion. She she's wonderful and For probably sure. the most unique character in the novella, in my opinion. I like her a lot. She's I like her in every version. She's so language. snarky. She's <laughs> just great. In the novella, she's just like the snarkiest person. Like at the end sorry, I mean it if you have come into this uh not wanting spoilers for Stardust, um, you should probably turn it off. I'm sorry. But uh, in the end of the novella, when the, the witches are defeated and Tristan is just kind of wandering around and Yvain's like, hey, let's go to the castle. And he's like, I guess I am a prince, huh? And she's like, yeah. And he's like, and you're in love with me, huh? And she's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I am. <laughs> For my sins, yes. <laughs> and he's like, oh, do you want to be my queen? And she's like, yep let's go <laughs> just takes his hand and goes and i'm just like listen Ivan, you are a queen i love you <laughs> it's it's pretty great it's um, so good so in the novella it, it, they definitely and, and actually both in the novel and the novella they're like we should probably go take over so oh uh, spoilers yeah I guess they're not again. super excited to go take no. over stormhold <laughs> no they're not they're neither of them have been raised to this or particularly want it per yeah se. i guess okay so here's the quick and dirty of the of the of the plot at the end of uh, so kaylee set up set it up really well so basically um everybody's after this stone and or the star and the star has the stone so everybody's basically after this one woman and her necklace tristan finds her uh finds that she's a star and is like yo i need to take you back to the wall and she's like i don't want to go back to the wall and he's like okay do it anyway and so that like they start going back to the wall and everybody's chasing them and chaos ensues at the end they do make it back to the wall back in time for this festival in the books uh, again there's a festival so they're back in time for this festival Tristan sees his family sees all the people that he left behind and they are more or less fine and he realizes that his place where he belongs is not in that world. They can't appreciate him for who he is. So he should stay here. And oh, by the way, the fairy that his dad boned, you know, 20 odd years ago was actually a princess. And she was, in fact, the sister of all these boys that have been chasing the stone. And to become, died. Yeah, to become the, the, the king. Uh, they're all dead. And so she is now essentially the queen. And uh, they just need to free her. And they do accidentally. And basically everything Tristan does in these books is accidental. Uh, it's, it's very funny to me. <laughs> absolutely. No, again, you've got the character of like the yeah. lucky fool. That's yeah. 100% this kid. Yvain eventually figures out what's going on and does make some like 
targeted moves, but Tristan's just like bumbling around. It's so funny. Anyway, so it turns out Tristan is in fact the prince and is the king now, basically. And but Una gets to rule for a long time because yeah. he doesn't want to be king. He doesn't want king. to. So he and Yvain take like, I don't know, they take a long time. The to ultra, just... it's like three to five years. Yeah, they, they like, send a letter and like, go around. we were unavoidably det- detained by doing yeah. other things. They don't feel like it. So Una becomes the queen for that amount of time and then she eventually retires and then Tristan and Yvain become king and queen and then spoilers for the books uh tristan does die because uh while the movie gives it all a happy ending and tristan and evane live forever um tristan is still human in the books and so he does die and evane lives forever and she just is queen forever and she's a very good queen the end yep it's an it's an interesting choice because i i would be very curious to see that like like the future for her kingdom and her she just rules forever she doesn't she doesn't not she i mean i guess eventually she could like abdicate if she wanted to yeah but, but that's what, i mean like i'd be so curious like the, the kingdom mm-hmm. and like all yeah, of the people exactly. that would want power or whatever oh and, like, i'm sure never having the transition possible would be interesting For um sure. it's just a, an interesting socio-political like concept yeah. in, in fairy tales yeah which you don't see a lot anyway so run let's go talk about the details the differences between the novella and the actual novel because the novel is what was optioned yes. to become the movie the differences in my in like the novel and the movie are I, I think we had briefly talked about this before. Like, the end state is the same. The starting and ending state. But, like, the way that they get there uh-huh. is so interesting. Because, like, Tristan's largely accidental in, in the book especially, mm-hmm. as we just said. In the movie, towards the end, he does start making specific choices. Um, and I think that it's really a, a matter of the nature of the media and the nature sure. of the audience is in question. Because... The, the novella and the novel, specifically, were written for readers of fairy tales. Right. And Neil they're, Gaiman... They're used to... Mm-hmm. Your your protagonist can be a bumbling idiot, and mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. It's just the person who is telling the story. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's not necessarily moving this person's story along. It's giving you information about the world, because that's originally what fairy tales were doing. They were informational and cautionary and stuff like that. It's a different sort of purpose to the stories. It's a lot of world building um, yeah. and it's less character building and yeah. character development. Like I right. said, Yvain is 100% in my opinion, the probably most interesting character because she's not immediately one archetype. She's probably got the most complexity. And in the movie, it's actually more focused on the characters, which I think makes sense because you can't convey the same amount of world building in the same amount of time because it's a lot of just here's just a couple words in the book you'd have to really flesh that out and make it relevant in a in a multi-million dollar movie so they're focused on getting the audience invested in a story well they are still telling all three stories <laughs> yeah they it very well yeah in my opinion you've still you've got the love story you've got the the princes on their their quest and you've got the three witches who are questing for eternal youth and life in the movie the characters are just a little more deliberate they're a little i I don't necessarily want to say they're smarter but they're Mm -hmm. certainly more i would say actually everybody's much smarter in the movie than they were in the books okay i mean that's fine (laughs) yeah that's fair honestly i maybe it's just that they're more observant or that the author has allowed the the creator has allowed them more agency perhaps in the maybe that's the a better way to a better way to say it yeah for better or worse because it's i think it's fascinating and deeply moving that in the book the way that yvain gets away from the witches specifically the way that story resolves itself in the book in the book Mm -hmm. actually in both both books in the novella as well as the novel yeah she just can't give them what they want which Mm -hmm. is her heart they want to cut it out and eat it basically so that they can take consume her power or whatever but she's already given it away in to tristan yeah to tristan so they it they're like oh i i'm taking your heart and then the spell doesn't work Mm-hmm. And she's like, perhaps it's not mine to give. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, you should have given it to us. And she's like, they're like, are you in love with that boy? And she's like, yep, that's for my sins. That's the one. And they're like, oh, man, you should have given it to us. And she's like, well, too late now. Here's where we're at. I'm BRB going to be queen forever. Yeah. Sorry, everybody. Yeah. And so the, <laughs> the, the, the witch is just like, oh, man. She's like, I hope your sisters aren't too mad at you for not bringing back my heart. Yeah. And she's like, oh, well. They'll be fine. I mean, they'll be terrible, but like, it's yeah. fine. Thanks yeah, for so the that's, thought. 
that's one of the big the big differences between the movie and the books is that in the movie there is a huge battle there's a climactic fight at the end between the witches and everybody else and in the books the witches just fail because they're bad they're just bad at things they're, mm-hmm. i mean as in they're evil and they are bad and they they and. hurt themselves and Yvain is like this heart is not mine to give to you anymore and, that's and then they just works. kind of slink away yeah. because and, that's and how fairy tales almost always are exactly and there's like a nod yeah in the three to five years that they're traveling right they quote unquote to deal with the witch queens right for separately their yeah. final time basically mm-hmm. yeah. end quote but it's not important yeah it's not it's not the point of the fairy tale right which is fine yeah there's just a lot more deliberate action and agency for the characters in the film we introduce um, additional motivations and complexities because yeah. the the audience the viewing audience doesn't have that look into the world and into people's heads mm-hmm. so they needed to see more reason to care there are very few characters in the novella and there are like a lot more in the novel and it's like then they then contracted That's... it into like a core group for the movie yeah. that is still more than the novella but they like combined than, yeah. and con- and like condensed the people from the novel and they changed a lot just because they couldn't really again make it worth it like yeah all of the magical people are just people they, mm-hmm. they just look like average human right oh yeah that's a good point yeah in the novella and even in the novel i um, would say in the novel more so because in the novel just, tristan looks like he's got like a half like half his face looks fey and half his face looks normal just his ears oh it was just his ears yeah. oh i thought it was like a half whole half face mm-hmm. thing okay nope just one ear is okay. kind of furry and pointy and one ear is normal um <laughs> yeah. imagine just having a furry pointy ear i remember reading that and being like oh no <laughs> I have to can't say. imagine which one of these children was the cuckoo. <laughs> yeah, right. Mm. Anyway, but yeah, like, so they just went with the, again, so certain things were just, to make it uh, uh, easier for the audience to connect visually. Yeah. Because you can connect emotionally with characters on page. Mm-hmm. You're, you're projecting and you're already invested in it. But with a movie, you know, it's a much wider potential sphere of influence and they're trying right. to draw people in. So they're trying to make them connect emotionally, like, through different means. And so that's an absolutely correct. They definitely expanded out the cast in the novel and it's not that large, but they gave more weight to certain characters. Like, again, speaking of the differences that we were just talking about, like the, the differences in how the story is told and developing the relationship and giving the plot right. the weight that it's supposed to have. In this case, the the love story was the point both ways, but less so in the, the novel, in mm-hmm. my opinion. It was about a, it was about world building and about the magic and about the the artifacts and the fairies and the witches and the way the world worked on the other side of the wall. Whereas in the movie, it was about the love first and the characters and the relationships that were built and about the adventure and like sharing that adventure with somebody beloved. And so, in the book stuff that was just kind of like a nod to the world and like giving you interesting things about the world that you can just think about later and like build on yourself they like super like expanded on like the lightning harvesters in the that movie was so interesting yeah so that's not really a thing in the book it's it's there but they're just like huh I don't normally see people stranded in the clouds. I guess we should take you back to civilization. And then they yeah. do. Captain Shakespeare is a very very small character in in the book and then in the movie robert de niro is wonderful he just chews on that scenery oh yeah but not only that they used that as a moment they were like well what can we do to really get people invested and understand like because they they had to have urgency for the film right they introduced a time frame right which is like a week yeah how do you get people to invest in this relationship so you make them young you make them in peril and then you give people the idea of time passing even though a lot of time couldn't have passed you use uh, in this case it was a very time honored tradition of the montage mm-hmm. um but you use that to like show them experiencing each other yeah. and learning about each other but yeah so they fleshed out on some of the characters the witches in my opinion were a lot more interesting in the movie everybody was more interesting even the princes were more interesting in the movie yeah so if you haven't seen the movie or read any of the books there's this bit that they keep doing where um the go- so that again the, the brothers are all chasing the stone as well these prince brothers and they are dying one by one and it starts out with about four of them are already dead and then as the story goes on all seven of them do die so 
they're just like there is like the peanut gallery just like commenting as ghosts on what's going on it's like so oh why funny. did you do that bro bro turn around she's right behind you sir don't drink that it's, it's like poison. Oh. it's so funny and then they like when one of them dies the others will just be like yo what's up bro now you're stuck here with us shouldn't have drank that we said it we told you not to drink it but did you listen? Listen? Mm. and he's like you're dead and they're like yeah you are too bud and it's a whole thing How it's so it funny feel? yeah it's, it's very, funny. very funny so they're basically the peanut gallery from minute one to the yeah. end and so again it's such a great way to provide yeah. comic relief that doesn't actually yes, disrupt yes. the tone of anything right. else because they are unto themselves so let's jump into this because i think that's a really good segue is tone <laughs> for those of you who are new to this podcast kaylee and i always approach our topics very very differently <laughs> that's so true kaylee, not even intentionally kaylee approaches Literally. this by reading the books and watching the movie i approach this by being like let's look at the numbers of the movie and like what it did and like what's the actual business stuff and like let's find the thing anyway so here's what happened <laughs> So lay it out there. The way that Hollywood contracts work is that there are options and there are rights. They, you can buy the rights to something and just hold them forever. The option is you have to do something with these rights or the rights go back to someone. So this movie of this book was actually optioned back when it was just an illustrated novella. So they didn't even have all of the things that we know and love from the movie today originally optioned for harvey weinstein or sorry bob weinstein and miramax and gaiman wrote a treatment this is before the novel came out so he was working on the novel in addition to working on this treatment for the movie and he quite famously after this and this is one of the reasons that he became very very protective of the rights of his stories and refused to allow them to be adapted into movies and shows uh the famous story is that someone wrote a uh, script for his Sandman stories, um, which is one of the things he was the most famous for. And he hated it so much that he leaked it and said, this is not only the worst Sandman script, this it's is the worst, the worst script, script I have ever seen. Mm -hmm. Today, we're in kind of a game and renaissance. We have Sandman on Netflix. We have Good, Good Omens on Prime. We've obviously had Stardust before. Coraline was released to great acclaim. We've got, I think American Gods is also on Prime. Pick your poison, pick your streaming service, you can find a Neil Gaiman story for you. So, like, today, like, we kind of take for granted that Gaiman stuff translates really well to screen, but at the time, that was not the case. Well, or just in general, people can write shitty versions of anything. If exactly. If you give them enough leeway. Yeah. So, famously, Gaiman was very protective of his rights in the mid-90s, and so when he kind of got this option and, and like, what do you want to do with this movie, the options that they gave him were not things that he really wanted, so... Miramax let the rights lapse and Neil Gaiman got the option back and he refused until um, he was convinced by Terry Gilliam, none other than Terry Gilliam of uh, Monty Python fame and Matthew Vaughn, who produced Lock, Stock and Two Smoking Barrels and Snatch. So he's the one who worked with um, Guy Ritchie. So people who Gaiman kind of is on the same level with and can really talk to. Gilliam eventually dropped out, but Vaughn stuck around and Vaughn acquired the option in 2005. So you can see how long it took them he to convince yep. Neil Gaiman. He was like, we're going to do this. In 2005, he entered uh, final negotiations with ultimately Paramount Pictures. So no Weinsteins were involved with the making of this movie. Matthew Vaughn wrote, produced, and directed Stardust. And you can tell that this was something that something that he really wanted to do because he, he took he took basically it all on. It was written by Vaughn and Jane Goldman, who was recommended by Gaiman directly. Again, you can see Gaiman was all over this. He was just like, you know what? We're, you're not doing this unless I am here the whole time. It was interesting. She she hadn't written any scripts before. She had just written like one or two novels. Uh, he was just a huge fan yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, and then she went on to speaking of Kingsman she went on to co-write the, the screenplays for Kingsman Secret Service Kingsman Golden Circle and X-Men First Class dun, dun, dun. yeah she did great work yeah. Um, she's very, very cool. fun movies. Very cool people. Um, so Vaughn and Goldman were the ones who actually did the script and mm -hmm. Gaiman was like in for that. So that was really how it worked out and Gaiman is actually the showrunner for both Sandman and Good Omen. So we know that Gaiman actually does know how to write 
and make these visual things work. It's just they didn't trust him back then. Which, so they had to like get someone else to do Keep in it. mind the actual level of garbage they had to have been like trying to procure <laughs> oh my God. instead. Like yeah. what? And, and, and consider like the number of terrible like comic movie adaptations. Oh and, God, like, yes. Other book adaptations. Yeah. Like let your writer take a shot. A like, shot, if nothing it's, else, a shot. Give, give them a chance because, yeah. like, clearly they can. They know the content. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. <laughs> like, why would? In fairness, you... we're saying this from a perspective of like seeing how good Neil Gaiman actually is and all this. I'm sure there are like book writers out there who are very bad at this. I would but... be fascinated <laughs> to actually see the reasons why. Yeah, I don't know. Content creators have that have created like a novel that people liked. Yeah. Neil Gaiman was, like, fighting them on a lot of things until, and this is one thing that I think actually uh, ended up working in Gaiman's favor, is he started doing audiobooks on audio dramas for his books around this same time. So he recorded the audio version of Stardust and then saw the final time. And then he realized there is no possible way to make a two-hour movie out of ten and a half hours of content from the book. So he's like, okay. So... Uh, Goldman and Vaughn were able to kind of uh, move some stuff around and they were able to focus more on the characters and the casting. So uh, Robert De Niro was actually one of the last people that was cast. And then once he came on as Captain Shakespeare, it doesn't say this anywhere, but my guess is that once Robert De Niro was cast, that uh, character expanded a little bit and that became their montage spot. I don't know that for sure. I can't imagine. But I do know that he was one of the last ones and a bunch of changes happened. Um, Michelle Pfeiffer was cast because obviously she is classically beautiful and obviously he's like, my first choice was michelle pfeiffer but if she wasn't going to be able to i had some other people that i was kind of thinking of and then michelle pfeiffer was in and he was like yes because it's so perfect because you've got michelle pfeiffer who is so known for her looks who is so beautiful but also is a wonderful actress and then throughout the movie she becomes more evil and also becomes more like terrifying and visually scary so he's like this is so important for it to be like this person and Claire Danes, uh, we've talked about how she was kind of coming off of her, you know, teeny bopper girl uh, fame and wanting to get into different kinds of roles. She wasn't in Homeland yet. She didn't have those like bona fides of being able to do these serious roles. And like Cyrus isn't a serious role, but it was like meant to have like a wide release and she was supposed to be the lead woman and all this stuff. And not only that, but she was genuinely like a character, yeah. like not just a prop. Exactly. Yes. Um, one of the things I do love about this movie is how smart everyone is. Like, no one's no one's just doing dumb shit. Like, Tristan's not really smart, but he's not dumb either. Like, he's, he just he just doesn't have a lot of the context naive. he needed. Yeah, exactly. In my opinion, he was uneducated. Yeah, but not not an idiot. So, Baby Charlie Cox is uh, Baby Charlie Cox. He's uh, this is pre Daredevil, pre all this other stuff. Like, he's not Charlie Cox yet. So he's like they got a new guy. One of the things that Matthew Vaughn talked about in interviews was they went through all of the leading men that were like on like the Paramount payroll or whatever. Mm -hmm. And they were like, we don't want to hire someone like Orlando Bloom and then just like give him glasses and then halfway through the movie, take the glasses off kind of thing. We want someone who like kind of (laughs) looks a little bit lame. And this is one of the things about Charlie Cox is that he looks like the guy next door. He just looks like the, the guy you grew up with. But then also, of course, he's, you know, fucking Very hot. He's, handsome, like, but he's <laughs> handsome in a way that is not Henry Cavill. Exactly. And of course, Henry Cavill is cast. He's a bit part, like a bit baby. Oh, you know who else is in this movie? Ben Barnes. That's baby right. Ben Barnes. Oh, I, to- I knew Cavill was in here. I totally yeah. had thought about that, but I totally didn't even think about yeah. Barnes. So Henry Cavill plays this bit part as, you know, Tristan's competition for Sienna Miller's uh, love and you know, affection. And he's just this like douchebag. <laughs> To be fair, I actually liked their characters mm. in the movie so much more because they he was a little douchey, but they, they actually genuinely loved each well, other. Well, it's a different it's a different person. In the book, so she marries that guy that oh, yeah. am I wrong? Monday. Monday, yeah. But, so there's a whole separate like yeah. subplot of the, yeah. the Monday prophecy, yeah. which we're not gonna get into because it's it like doesn't actually matter. No, it doesn't. <laughs> but I did like I I agree, I did like him in the movie a lot more, probably just because he's Cobble and Cobbles. It's like hard to dislike him. Yeah. And then, uh, so Ben Barnes plays Tristan's dad, the young version of Tristan's dad being adorable and just like walking around like a little doe-eyed baby and seeing this woman and being like, wow, you're really pretty. And her being like, 
And you're just like, I, I would, got the night off. I would. Yeah. <laughs> it's Ben Barnes. Yep. He's so cute. Anyway, so they were able to kind of make these changes to the story. And I think that it worked perfectly. Yeah, no, I'm speaking of what we had said before, uh-huh. like, yeah. one of the few instances where both things are excellent. Mm hmm. In their own rights. Mm-hmm. And that they both do different things so well that you can start with one and be disappointed that the things that it did well in the other are not there, but still love both of them. Yeah. And vice and the Absolutely. same thing. And it goes yeah. back and forth in my opinion, because like the characters and the, the heart of the movie, yeah. you might miss that. But there's so much more magic and mystery yes. and the world feels larger, in yeah. my opinion, in the books. Again, potentially a disservice to almost every other, like, because can you imagine, like, any other, like, book adaptation? Like, I think Lord of the Rings might be the one that's the other closest one. It's funny that you brought up Lord of the Rings because there's a lot going on here behind the scenes that was, like, a reaction to Lord of the Rings. Oh, yeah. Um, so you know how, like, every fantasy movie ever now has to shoot in New Zealand? Yeah. So these guys were like, no. We're not. Um, we're going to Ireland and Iceland. And that's yeah. so that some of those big, wide, gorgeous shots of yes. the glaciers and the cliffs. Those are Iceland. And you can feel it. Like, mm-hmm. it changed the tone. Sure, yeah. From no, the, like, standard, oh, New Zealand. And nothing nothing against New Zealand. Lord of the Rings is incredible. Mm-hmm. Avatar's incredible. Narnia's incredible. What else is sought in New Zealand? Uh, Hobbit was incredible. Like, it was so wonderful. It's wonderful. But we've seen it, you know. And this is, like, in direct response to that. So... This was shot for about 70 to $88 million. The, the music was incredible, uh, composed by Ilan Eshgary. He had worked with Vaughn on the other, mm-hmm. on some of, some of the other Guy Ritchie um, and uh, crime ones. And uh, they used, obviously, a lot of the art originally from Charles Vess's illustrations from the illustrated version mm-hmm. so that they were able to kind of have that, like, really easy, just, like, throw into the storyboard. So, again, this was really well received by audiences, but it premiered to not great acclaim it ultimately earned about 137,000 or sorry 137 million dollars worldwide which is not at all bad but, but not, what not at all what they needed yeah. for a sequel um the reception uh, rotten tomatoes has the film at about 77 percent. that's actually pretty good which is tomatoes. yeah oh it's fantastic the critics consent uh it was ultimately released on a uh, dvd and did again quite well yeah so uh vaughn also talks about again like the studio promoted as if it were lord of the rings but he's like look it was much more influenced by the princess bride yes. and it's almost the exact same like princess bride didn't did well in the theaters but it did much better in the home market mm-hmm. same thing with wizard of oz like it's yes it's a fantasy but it's a different type of fantasy than sure. that lord of the rings than that narnia mm-hmm. than that avatar sort of mm-hmm. thing i didn't even realize to be honest that the marketing because you were looking more into the marketing had focused on trying to frame it like lord of the rings yeah. i would never have yeah thought that from the movie frankly right because it's not at Princess all Bride that is so yeah. much more obvious as way like, more the go-to if you needed yeah. an analog but like no i was just thinking that the way that they kind of adapted the books and pulling out the character focus and the character development and having to leave, not necessarily leave, but not being able to lean into the mythology and the yeah. backstory as much as Tolkien had and included in the novels because of the nature right. of the media. As far as successful adaptations go, I would say that those two, in my opinion, are probably like the best. 100 But I was actually like forming my own list of the the uh, opposite, which is uh, movies that are made into books mm-hmm. separately that I really yeah. enjoyed. Yeah. I'm, I'll have to go back and find my list and I'll, yeah. I'll show you because it's just, just we should do different. That. That's it's cool. so different. What other book to movie adaptations do you think we should do soon? Oh, I would be interested to see. Can we just, can we just do book to screen? Because I am Oh, sure, so sure, sure. Curious. Book to movie or book to TV. Yeah, yeah, yeah because like we've got Good Omens. Mm. Sandman is so good. To our Neil Gaiman suite. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Let's just get them all out of the way. I haven't watched the American Gods show yet. It's very, for when you go from book to screen, it's very rare that you'll hear anybody that, that enjoys reading mm-hmm. say that they liked the movie more or mm-hmm. even as much as. But it is possible. There are some instances, and we've already talked about like this, this one, yeah. like yeah. Stardust, yeah, um, where it's it, it happens. It's just it's, it's at just, least on par, if not better. Exactly, as, it's, as, as it, much as I'm willing to give it. Uh, no, no, it's it's, it's they, they're both good at different things, in my opinion. Yeah, yeah, they both hit ten out of ten, but in different areas. Yes, absolutely. In my so it just depends on what you're in the mood for. Um, I'm not sure if I, I know what one I want to do next for sure. Okay, but like we can go back to our list and look through it. But, um, like, we're getting ready to see Interview with the Vampire. That's coming we out. We are. Soon. That might be the next thing we should do. Yeah. I mean, if it's out by then. Um, sure. We've got later, much later, we've got, we can look at the comparison 
which we don't frequently get, but we could do that with Interview with the Vampire. We can do it where we've got the TV show movies and the TV show Ooh, versus the smart, versus the novels. Smart. The Percy Jackson movies versus the she- the series Coming, that's about yeah. to come out versus the novels. Yeah. Thanks for listening. I've been Annie. I'm Kaylee. You can find us on anywhere you have podcasts. And if you want to find us on somewhere that we are not on, let us know. Uh, you can email us at inksingpodcast. <laughs> inksingpodcast at gmail.com. We are happy to uh, provide. You can also follow us on Twitter and Instagram and wherever you would like. Hit us up on Anchor. Hit us up on Anchor. If you would like to support us, you can absolutely do that on, I believe, Anchor and Spotify. Monetarily and emotionally. And emotion. We love emotional support. <laughs> um, if you want to s- comment, please comment. send us your pet pictures. Yes, always. To Inksing Podcast. Roscoe. Props. He's so a very cute, cute little puppy. Oh my god. Thanks, Brandon. Inksingpodcast at gmail.com. And if you want to support us, you can for as low as a dollar a month. Uh, we'll go 100% to research. Oh my gosh, it absolutely <laughs> will. Guys, I just want you to understand, Annie is genuinely um, like soundproofing the room with I am. egg cartons. Like I am. We are a 100% uh, farm-to-table podcast. <laughs> So any money that you send our way is going to be directly back into the podcast. <laughs> There's no profit here. We're a non-profit because there's nothing. <laughs> our anyway. lives are non-profit, Annie. <laughs> Thanks, Abby. Thanks, Abby. We appreciate you so much. Thanks for listening.